Hello, everybody. Welcome to a, 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 a another live stream with Jeannie Vlogger. Kind of tripped on my words there. Uh, welcome. Um, today, I kind of didn't have anything planned, so I figured, well, I'll just build my own family tree and chat genealogy and, you know, so many updates from uh, Roots Tech and things being rolled out after Roots Tech. So probably a lot of questions I imagine people have about what I'm thinking about things or what I've played around with. So uh, first, let's uh, do our typical and say hello. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Brian. <laughs> Love the hat. You look more Irish than I do in that picture. Yeah, I definitely rocking that hat and the way I had the beard then. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I look very Irish. Uh, hello, Sharon coming in from New York. We also have Anna coming in from Western New York. Drea coming in from Massachusetts, still chilling. We have Tasha coming in from sunny but cold Minnesota. And, of course, Brian's coming in from uh, PEI Canada, which Prince Edward Island. It took me a second to remember what PEI would be. Welcome, Bro uh, Blackberry Rose, one of our wonderful uh, mod admins. Whichever role it truly is, I never remember. <laughs> uh, hello, Kirsten, uh, coming in from Helsingborg, Sweden. Wonderful to have you. One of the longest Genie YouTube members, I believe, um, for a long time, which thank you so much for supporting the channel for so long. Uh, for those who don't know, I have YouTube membership. If you click join, I think it's right below the video or whatever. You pay a couple of bucks a month and you get some special access to stuff and special emojis that you can use in chat. And it's kind of similar to Patreon, but a little bit different. And, you know, I don't know. It's just another way to support the channel. But you can see one of the cool emojis that you get access to there, the genie tree. Hello, Ascertain20 coming in from Hudson Valley, New York. We have Ironicles. Ironicles, formerly Ironicles and Sardonicles. Hello, hello. Alexandra coming in from Koblenz. Welcome, welcome. Um, Ascertain listening to Kurt Vile walking on a pretty day, and it works so well with this starting soon screen. That's awesome. <laughs> My head popping up. Um, let's see. We've got Stig coming in from Oslo, Norway. Wonderful to have you as usual. RS, can you explain to me why Asian features are so explicit? Like if someone has little Asian DNA, he looks very Asian even after intermixing with other races for generations. Uh, that's not really something I could answer that has more to do with phenotyping and things like that, which is not quite as much my forte. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't really know, you know, gene expression is not, you know, something I really deal with. So, sorry. Uh, Peter Buvik coming in from Bergen Municipality in Norway. We've got a lot of Scandinavian representation today, but also a lot of German representation. We have Sunny Zitron coming in from Germany. Hello. Hello, all of all. <laughs> Sajuka, greetings from Ukraine. Unfortunately, I've already missed a few streams and I'm so glad I can finally join you. Glad to have you here. Hope everything is going well for you. I know things are obviously very difficult right now. Uh, we've got Karma coming in from Nebraska. Thank you, Karma. Wonderful to have you. Uh, we've got Kirsten showing off some more of those emojis. Thank you. Oh, Kosovo coming in. I haven't seen you in a while. Kosovo is Kosovo Productions. Have you seen the full text search tool at Family Search? It's been very helpful. Yes, I did see the full text search. Uh, it is very interesting. It's um, I, I think it's always good to have another way of manipulating searches because I find, especially with the digitized databases and such, it sometimes really comes down to manipulating the search in a way to find things you wouldn't otherwise. So having that full text search really gives you such a wider array. So I'm, I haven't played with it as much yet, but I, I I'm planning to. So, um, and then we've got James coming in from London. Wonderful to have you, James. So we've got, as usual, a worldwide representation with only about 30 of us in here. So I, I think that's pretty good. I think that's pretty good. Um, so I, I think most of you all are pretty, pretty familiar with, uh, with my tree. Oh, I need to close that. Um, it was, I've been working on a lot of stuff lately, not on my own tree, but actually for some, uh, of the YouTuber family tree series. And one of those episodes, uh, which will be coming up, I don't know when exactly, but I've been working very hard on it. Um, uh, 
one of the guest grandparents was adopted. And I have been working to get that solved. So my heritage is actually... Uh, sponsored this research they sent five dna tests to our uh, youtuber guest uh their their siblings and their parents they all took the test and working on identifying that uh grandparents adopted family and i am fairly confident i have identified the biological father so that's i've been like for the past few days oh my gosh i've been like really getting into that and that's part of why today i didn't really have much planned because it was like i've been so you know so into that so that's gonna be really really cool because i'm gonna um once that video comes out that video i'll be diving into all, all the little tricks i've been using for this and uh some of it's some of that in-depth stuff you know using visual phasing dna painting the newest version of the watto tool so there's watto 3 uh, which if you haven't used, definitely use that. Um, but then also on top of that video, that I also have all the other videos I'm doing. I'm trying to finish up on the video about my trip to Europe last year. Um, and then I'm going to be working on, I, I've already started researching and I've gotten a lot of stuff already. I probably should have been doing this video way before, uh, but we'll, I'll be doing a video about do historians hate genealogy? So I'm actually kind of curious if any of you have had any experiences with historians, librarians, archivists, archaeologists, or just any other people within the history world hating on genealogy, comment in the comments. Um, and actually, you know what? Post in the Reddit. Uh, do a post in the Reddit. Just flag it as not a question. And then in the title, just say, uh, you know, hating genealogy or something. Um, but yeah, so I'm working on that video and then there's going to be a really, really good video. I'm working on the next YouTuber family tree video, not the one I was talking about, but a different one, uh, is going to, we're going to go back to, uh, Joseph Hall Patton cipher, uh, the cynical historian. So lots of, lots of stuff to, to say, um, yeah. Oh, hey, coming in from Finland. We've got so much Scandinavian representation today. Although I know Finland kind of is a little different. I know, I know, but wonderful to have you. Um, James Burton, I always have to specify which London I'm talking about. I'm originally from London, Ontario, which I refer to as fake London. And then I think there's also a London, Kentucky, I think. I've, I know there's a few Londons around the world, so that's pretty funny. Uh, that must be a new YouTuber in the series then. Actually, this YouTuber, the one I'm talking about with the uh, grandfather was adopted, is one that I've already covered. Yeah. Uh, that episode of YouTubers Family Tree sounds really interesting. Looking forward to it. Um, oh, I actually got something inspired from your blog and other genealogy blogs and recently started a blog trying to identify who man who claimed to be the first Indian man in the United States. Interesting. Really cool. Feel free to uh, link the link the blog in the chat. Let people check it out. Um, yeah. Ooh, and I'll post even more <laughs> on the Reddit, but I actually have the opposite experience. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I want to hear all sorts of experiences with that. So I've actually already, I've already had about a half dozen, uh, YouTubers in the history tuber space submit videos about their thoughts on history and genealogy. And yeah, so it, it's going to be a fun video. I just need to, I just need to actually get to it. I've I had I, so much other stuff on my plate. You know, there's a reason why I quit the job so I could focus on this. So I could have, you know, doing all this research and doing all these things. Uh, so, oh, hello, Keith coming in from St. Albans in the UK. Wonderful to have you. And three blood, I won, but not from Scandinavia. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, with my tree, I wasn't sure which way we would go up the tree this time. Um, you know, last time we focused on my Sephardic ancestry. But I was also kind of considering going up and looking into some of the Dutch Ashkenazi ancestry I have. Um, to talk a little bit about this line of the family. So this is my great-grandfather, Morris Alvin Nunes Vaz. And his mother, Jane Moscow, was one-eighth Sephardic. 
So her great grandmother, Rachel was Sephardic, but all of her other great grandparents, well, all of the ones we know uh, were Ashkenazi, Dutch Ashkenazi. Now on her father's line, interestingly enough, and I've actually been kind of looking into the possibility of figuring this out through Y DNA testing, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to, we'll have to see. Um, but basically he was born to a mother, Rachel Dahan, and no father. And with the records in Amsterdam, you know, we get a lot of really good records in Amsterdam. And there, I think from everything I've seen, it basically, it kind of says that, you know, he's not, uh, he, he does not have a father, a known father. So he was part of what was known as the Putz movement. Some people call it the Chutz movement. Uh, it's it, it was a migration of Dutch Jews in the 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s. And I guess into a little bit later, who went from Amsterdam and other areas in the Netherlands to London, most specifically East London, uh, East End. And um, they all worked in... Uh, either like cigar rolling or, well, I mean, just look at this page, basically cigar rolling, stripper maker, uh, cap maker, shoemaker, tailors, things like that. Uh, but uh, for the large majority, it was cigar making, at least in my family that was. And uh, actually the famous Samuel Gompers, he descends from this uh, movie. I had a video on this actually a few years ago, uh, but he descends from this movement and he's a famous labor person. And basically he grew up working in, um, here we go. He grew up working in cigar rolling factories and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So his parents were born in Amsterdam. He's actually a cousin of mine, um, distantly. And then he's also closer related he married uh, one of my ancestors' siblings. I'm trying to remember which line. I think it was the Robles line. But anyway, yeah. So Samuel Dahan right here, his wife Clara, and then above them a Palash family with very typical uh, Sephardic Dutch Sephardic names. And the Palash family is a very famous family um, connected to Samuel Palash, the famous. The famous pirate rabbi who wasn't technically a pirate. He was technically a privateer, but you know, that's a, that's a historical argument. You know, technically privateers are just government funded pirates, but anyway, so yeah, then in the family, we have the children, Esther, Cosman and Levi, and then Esther, uh, that's my, um, That's my third great grandmother, Esta. So, okay. So, with Samuel Dahan, let's actually let's pull up the Amsterdam archives. The Chement Amsterdam Stads Archive. Oh, yeah. I should probably put it in a civil spot for everybody. Um, so Samuel Dahan, 1816. Ooh, I, look at transcribe us. So one of the beautiful things about the Amsterdam archives is that they have a transcribe us project, which I think was one of the first ones. And so they're literally using transcribe us to transcribe thousands of handwritten documents um and so oh, it doesn't look like we have any very good hits but it's like i've actually found use from this because it scans all these documents that are things that usually get indexed last like notary stuff like yeah notarial records so people's dealings in business and all sorts of things. Um, now here with Samuel Dahan, it looks like everything. 
usually I see towards the top the best options. You know, if you have like a name like Samuel Dahan, like let's see the Zoch options. Um, yeah, let's do Zoch. But basically, when you look for, um, you know, the search, it'll give you the best options towards the top. And if you start out seeing a bunch of options like this, where it's basically, it's kind of the names you're looking for, but it's like scattered all throughout. I mean, look at this, just Samuel and De, which De is a form of the in, uh, in, in the Dutch. It's either De or He. So it's. Yeah, so it in a sense. So super common. Um, <laughs> I'm just checking chat right now. Where? Oh, Retta, wonderful to have you here. Uh, we've got a fun project going on here in Boston with Genealogy and Boston Tea Party participants right now. That's awesome. That's cool. Is any HGS part of that? Because I feel like they're usually a part of a lot of that stuff. Uh, does the doctor from Doctor Who count? He points and laughs at archaeologists. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I should get a clip of that to use in the video, though. Moscow is a cool last name. Nice. Thanks. It's actually, it's it's technically Moscow, M-O-S-C-O-U. And they changed it to Moscow, O-W, uh, when they came to um, the U.S., so go by her family tree. Ah, did not mean to click there. Um, yeah, so it's like Moscow. And interest, so very interesting about the Moscow family. Um, Abraham Moscow had his first wife who passed away in 1847. And he had had a lot of children with her. Um, or maybe it was just Samuel. Maybe it was just, I don't know. I'll have to double check because I, I need to build this part out. It's mostly built on uh, Genie for me. But anyway, so he had a lot of children with his first wife. And then he married his second wife. And I think, yeah, they, they had their first few children in Amsterdam, but then moved to uh, London yeah, because, okay, yeah, they moved to London with all of their children, I think, in, like, the 1860s. So all of the children from his second family were in London, and all of the children from his first family were in Amsterdam. And when the uh, Holocaust happened during World War II, a large majority of the descendants from his first wife, the children of his first wife, ended up being murdered in the Holocaust. Some of them survived, and when I was in Europe this past year, I met one of my Moscow cousins who descends from one of the lines that survived through the war. Um, so that the Europe trip video is actually going to be very interesting. I'm kind of a little worried because I cover a lot about the Holocaust, and YouTube sometimes doesn't like that, and they're like, oh, you're talking a lot about some really dark parts of history? Okay, well, demonetize that video and age-restrict it and I don't know if they're going to go that, that hard in it, but it, it's been a serious issue for a lot of history creators is, you know, we got to talk about history and yeah, I'm sure you've all seen a lot of stuff. So, okay. Uh, let's see. So um, ah, you're not too far from me. I'm directly South of you and Dallas. Hill. I love, I love people connecting uh, through, through my chat. So that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay. Let's jump Rosie. Hello. Wonderful to have you here. Um, yeah, feels like automated transcribing is about to be the next big thing in genealogy. OCR technology is part of that AI package. With AI, everyone's always talking about generative AI, chat GBT, uh, which is more specifically a large language model. But there's so many parts of AI that I think are going to be really big that aren't as talked about. And transcribing OCR technology is technically one, although that one's been around a lot longer and in use for a long time already. But then another one's going to be facial recognition, which I've talked about a bit. Uh, I did see a company. Um, I didn't. Oh my gosh, I probably have it somewhere around here. The little insert thing or whatever I got from the expo hall. But there was a company. Uh, if you go and watch my uh, live stream 
at Roots Tech that I go and talk to who do uh, that, uh, do facial recognition. Um, and was at EHGS running the, uh, the thing in Boston. So awesome. Um, okay, cool. So, all right. So to what we were focusing on, which was basically figuring out just kind of looking at the records for Samuel Dahan because he did not have a known father. And so we did that search, didn't work. So now we're going to go into the index. So the index is really nice. And actually, I'll, I'll just make this easier for everyone. I'll turn it to English. <laughs> um, so one of the nice things is that you can actually... Uh, manipulate the search here pretty well and usually when you go by date the date is the date of birth so it's not just like always the date of whatever that's so funny you see how it's translating dahan to rooster because that's what dahan is rooster dahan <laughs> samuel rooster so okay born about 1816 all right, I'm sorry, I have to do it in Dutch. It's, it's throwing me off. All right, so first we're going to look at the Bevolking registers, which this is basically a census record, but more like a revision list in that we see names crossed out because these people are leaving the household. And this is all making a lot of sense, in fact, because so here we have my second great-grandmother, Jane, who actually, let's see if there's uh, someone's put one of her photos up because she looks very much like me like everyone in my family is always like oh my gosh jared that's definitely but yeah so i'm not sure what you all think i know it's kind of, it's kind of small i don't know if i can really but yeah here let's see hold on i'm gonna move this around What do you think? What do you think? Cut out the beard. <laughs> I don't know. But the big thing is, is that she had red hair. Uh, that was kind of part of it was that, you know, being that she's a redhead. Oh, whoa. Hey. Um, there we go. Okay. But yeah, so doesn't look quite as much as me anymore but <laughs> back when uh back when i didn't have a beard a bit more but okay so let's go back so samuel dehan and here we have samuel dehan 1817 he's in amsterdam um, and then this is telling us over here, basically kind of like what happened to him. Where do you go? Cobort plots, Amsterdam, Bergelijke, Bergelijke. <laughs> Gosh, I'm working on my Dutch really, really hard. But okay, so we have Samuel. I think that's his wife. Yeah, Gella Stiesel. Uh, then we have probably, the, yeah, these are their, okay, yeah, of course, I didn't even look at it. Puffer, Val, Zoom, doctor, doctor, his mother, but that's actually not his mother, that's her mother, his wife's mother, so his mother-in-law. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. You're so supportive. I, I love that. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Gazillion. Get no from my Portuguese representation. Uh, Karma. You can see a resemblance. Blackberry Rose resemblance. She has more hair on top and less on chin. But yes. Yeah. I guess. Uh, is Jane Moscow one of your grandmothers? So Jane Moscow is one of my second great grandmothers. So she's my um, my mother's father's father's mother. So my grandfather's grandmother. 
yeah. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of people see the resemblance. Some, so yeah, upside down. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. It's very true. Uh, good thing she didn't live during Salem. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. So back to this. So with Samuel, we have the Vulcan register. We definitely know it's the family. Uh, he seems to be the head of the household, which is really interesting. Now, I actually haven't even really looked that in depth into this, which is why it's kind of a perfect option. Um, but then you can see that there's kind of like a whole nother family down this way. So you see how hoofed, hoofed. See, what does that even mean? I, I'm still, my my Dutch uh, vocabulary is probably at like 300 or so. Head. Oh, that makes sense because like hat is hold. Hold that. Uh, so head of the family. Vrouw, woman, wife, Zoon, doctor, doctor, and then another head of the family. But they are Italiander. So, yeah, some connection. But that's not really going to help us that much in terms of the goal of our research right now, which is to try to figure out what the deal is with his uh, father. So, that's. Not it. That was born 1798. All right, let's see. Military register for Samuel. So we got Samuel Dahan, Clement, Amsterdam, province, North uh, Holland, North Holland, uh, military Canton, Amsterdam, Da 26. Mond, October, year 1814. Um, okay. Born name Van de Vader, on the Name Van de Mutter, de Haan. Born name Van de Mutter, Rachel Samuel. Von Plotz, Marcus de. So, um, yeah. oh, that's so funny, David. Wait, was there was their name Moscow? I didn't know that because Newsies was like my favorite movie growing up. I was obsessed with Newsies, which actually, funny enough, why I like hats like the one I I'm wearing in the uh, thumbnail. And actually, if you watch the live stream from when uh, from from Roots Tech. They actually had uh, at my heritage a guy dressed up like a newsie handing out newspapers about um, their new old news uh, website or whatever. And when I left, I was like, "Seize the day!" So that's awesome. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that's why I connected so well with that movie. I was technically related to them in some way. <laughs> Good evening. Working on Nunes Vaz. Yes, John. Actually, working on a, a line off of my Nunes Vaz family, but Dutch uh, Ashkenazi. So, yeah. Um, but okay. So, right now we're looking at the military register. But what's really interesting so, Baroque here, now look at three. Van de Mother by Yaldine de Vader is overlaid in, in London. So, from the mother. And then I actually don't know, Lijel. The, the father is buried in London. So interesting. Now on begend. Unknown. That's what I thought. Okay. So Van de Vader, Zudi, and Leven is on the end. Van de Inge Screven, Screvene. Interesting. So, okay. Okay. So. But one of the things I've thought about, basically, and I need to, I, I need to, 
start looking into the research again. But basically, you know, with Samuel having an unknown father, he did have sons who went on to have descendants. So if I can go through and possibly find living male descendants who are still Dahan, get them to do a wide DNA test, then that may help us turn up what it's supposed to be. Because especially if it's coming from a Dutch family, whether it's Dutch Jewish or not Dutch or non Jewish Dutch, you know, Dutch uh, reformed or something like that, or whatever it may be, um, you know, most Dutch family trees are really well traceable. They're really easy to build out. So I would think that, you know, why DNA testing could probably turn, turn it up. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So what is this record? Copied parts. Okay. Not familiar with this. But all right, we've got the Dahans. So we need to see Samuel. Okay, Samuel Dahan, Gelapinus Stiesel, Levi Dahan. So his wife and his son, 1817, 1821, born 1864, Amsterdam. Yeah, Gabort Plots. Gabort Plots. Bopman. Mark and Plain. Yeah, I'm not. This, this is one I'd need to look into. That's not a record I uh, deal with as much. And it looks like he's gone after that. So, oh, wait. No. So, yeah. I'm not getting a whole lot. Um, and then if we look at these last Bavalking registers, it's probably going to tell us that he's moved over to London. Uh, so kind of, so basically it's, you know, 3rd of November, 1847 goes to Copenhagen, December 6, 1877, October, 1885. Did he die in Amsterdam? Where did he die? I don't have his death. 1893 in Amsterdam. Um, okay, let's... We can actually search the... Dutch um, civil re registers. And I usually actually prefer to search them on family search. Three thirty. Okay. 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 Um, do all Dutch records have clear handwriting like that? Not all. I mean, in my experience, once you get into the 1800s, it's usually pretty legible, but there's definitely a lot of stuff like even in the 1800s, but especially once you get back into the 1700s and 1600s that the handwriting gets crazy. But I mean, it, it varies. There are some record books where, you know, it'll be different people writing in different periods. And so you'll have one period where it's like super legible and then all of a sudden it changes to the new guy. And it's like, he's got doctor style handwriting and it's like so difficult to read. So it can really, really vary. But for the most part, once you get into the 19th century, it gets really, really good. 
Um, okay, so Samuel Dahan and we go eighteen seventeen in Amsterdam. Von Amsterdam. And there we go. See, that's that's why I do this on, on Family Search. Dutch Civil Records on Family Search. Super easy to find. Super, super easy to find. So this is exactly what we needed. I wanted to figure out what was his death date. Boom, we got it. Now, the way they do it, there's three to each page. Um, so we just got to figure out which one is his. Why can't I find this? Oh, there we go. Okay. So, and we have. So is this actually okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, this handwriting is not easy. Um, number three five three six. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're going in twos. Um, Abraham Walker. Okay. There we go. Is overlaid in Samuel DeHaan. Van Baro Pain. Vaninda Market Plain. In the under dumb van Warren. All right, so gives the mother, gives the wife. This may birth eighteen, so it's definitely may, whatever. So. Boop. In this part, I actually I'm gonna need to <laughs> I'm gonna need to make sure I, I don't know what's gonna be seeable here. Kind of <laughs> kind of curious. Okay, good. You can't see none of this. Boop, 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 pop, 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 pop. What was this? This was 15 May 1893. Location Amsterdam. Oh, wait, let's see. They have a better link. We'll keep it like that. Yeah, that's good. That's good enough. Das is gut. So one other thing that if you didn't realize that you can do is you can actually link stuff down, down here. So you can like either just add a source. You want to do it like that. Or you can add a web link. So just as an example, we'll do this one. I'm just going to double check that it actually takes us back here. Oh. But I'll sometimes I'll do both just because um, 
not everyone knows how to do in-depth searching. So when they go to this profile, if they want to look into it and see, you know, what are you actually using? Um, Yeah, I'll just call it a register. I know they call it an index, but it's not really as much of an index. So yeah, so then when people come and they can see, oh yeah, look at that. So um and with that, we're gonna do wait, no, was it okay, it was <laughs> like doubting myself 1893. Was it 1893? Tell me I'm right. Si, senor. Um, looks like lots of detail to that record. Yeah, it's and that one, sometimes with the Dutch records, if it's decently legible handwriting, I can get to it. Um, although this one, it's not just like, necessarily because of the writing it's also it's largely because of the fading and it also is probably one of their older uh one of the ones that was indexed like a longer time ago so like let's actually take a look like this is something people can do to see like you know if if it's looking kind of older um they don't say this definitely looks old school We have a date there. Uh, I don't know. Okay, but yes. Yeah, so <laughs> oh, 1987. It's, it's, so this was digitized 1987. So it's at the Nord Holland Archive or the Reichs Archive. So the um they probably have it digitized. So one now that we have, we could probably find a better version of it. But I definitely find it's way easier to find it on uh, Family Search. So let me see if I can find it on Ancestry. Which, yes. All right. Well, let's see. Samuel Dehan. 1893. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, I didn't even think about that. Vivas V. Um, No. All right, let's try it this way. Okay. No, they couldn't. Is it? No, okay, it's a birth record. Is it? Wait. Okay. <clears throat> Just trying to find the... Did he die? Oh, yeah, it was May 15th. So, no, it couldn't be, because that's September... Or August. Excuse moi. Um, yeah. All right. Don't need to. Don't need to figure it out. All right. All right. Let me check. <laughs> Yeah, I usually add a web link to the ancestors family search profile, wiki tree profile. Yeah, I 
I kind of just try to keep bare bones trees on some, some, well, not necessarily keep them bare bones, but trees that I don't focus on as much where it's like, I'll go and check it every once in a while. But for the most part, I just try to mostly focus on updating my ancestry tree right now and then updating genie, um, genie.com. So it, I think, you know, it depends on how you want to do stuff, but if like you want to keep all of your kind of, if you have multiple more main trees that you want to keep up, that's definitely, definitely not a bad idea to, you know, add it every single place you can. Although I know I've had to limit myself just cause just time. Um, I have a terrible habit of adding the source just as a link in the description of the event itself. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things too, with a lot of the websites in their sourcing is that there's so many ways to do it that you'll get a wide variation. And I think that's one of the things with Genie that a lot of people don't realize is they'll go and look at profiles and think there's no source ad added when they don't realize it actually like, oh no, it was added elsewhere. So like in the early days, everyone would seem to kind of add documents and stuff as photos. But then Genie rolled out their documentation and then their sources stuff. And then when my heritage bought them and they started to kind of connect the systems in a way where you could link you know, documents that you had confirmed through my heritage on there, then it was like you had all of these variations. And so there are some profiles where I've seen people say like, you know, I don't see any documentation showing it. And then you look and you're like, oh, well, it's there. It just, it's not, exa- you know, it wasn't in the document side. You had to just look in the photos, look in the little <laughs> discussion thing or just, you know, so, and that's one of the reasons why I know a lot of people love WikiTree is because WikiTree forces the citations you try to add anything, you have to cite it. And I I have to give them credit because it does give their tree a little bit more level of um, protection, I guess would be a way to say it. I, I, I wouldn't call it necessarily accuracy because once you kind of figure out how to kind of do it, you could technically like get around that pretty easily by just every time just citing it's what I know, you know, not what I would suggest. And I imagine if wiki treers caught on to that, they'd probably, you know, ban you from the site or something. Well, I don't know if they do that, but you know, they, they wouldn't be take kindly to, to, you know, circumventing the system, but because of the way they've done it, they've made it so that when things do get added, there is some level of sourcing to it more than what you typically can get. Um, Eric Kidder. Hi, Jared. I am Eric's son, Brandon. I'm using my dad's iPad because my iPad is old. No mean or brag support, but I am a descendant of William Bradford and Edward Fuller of the Mayflower. All right. Very cool. That also means that you're related to thousands upon thousands of other Mayflower descendants from William Bradford and Edward Fuller. Cause so, you know, you're coming from one of the families where there was a marriage in there. So, um, I know some of the YouTubers that I've built the trees out for have a connection to William Bradford. There are a lot of who do you think you are and finding your roots who trace people up that. So, but very cool. Um, Maven also, I'm heading to the state historical society tomorrow. So I guess I have to get you some micro films again. Yeah. I, I kind of don't miss dealing with those micro film, micro fiche machines. And, you know, it, it always felt like when I would go from one archive or library to another, their machines were just slightly different enough that it was like, I don't know, you'd have to like try to refigure it out. Maybe it just was, I just wasn't going enough that every time I went, it felt like it was new, but it was just like, I don't know. It, I just always found them annoying and the index cards, and, you know, going through all of the drawers and getting, you know, yeah, just annoying. Uh, especially because when you go to those places, you need to have somebody there to really kind of assist you in a way. And if you had someone there that wasn't very good at assisting, it made it so much more difficult. Um, I add a lot of web links to my ancestry trees from the Swedish state archive, Reichs Archivet. Reichs Archivet. Archivet. <laughs> Membership is free. That's good to know. That's definitely good to know. Because as I can see from my audience, there are a lot of people here in, uh, from Sweden. So I imagine a lot of you uh, will probably get used to that if you didn't know. Um, okay. Do you use genealogy software on your computer or is Ancestry your main tree? So yeah, I've basically turned it into Ancestry as my main tree. And then Genie, I kind of also consider my main tree, but really in the sense of like, it's my main tree, 
that I host for my cousins to join in and stuff, but I understand that it's the world tree. Part of why I changed to having G uh, Ancestry as my main tree because I used to be someone where genie.com was my main tree and I do research through Ancestry. So, you know, when I go into my tree and build something out and do that, uh, you know, that's where I'd improve the Ancestry tree. But it wasn't until like maybe three or four years ago, maybe a little bit longer actually now that I think that it's 2024 because it was pretty much right around when I started my YouTube channel in 2017. So yeah, I guess maybe seven years ago or so. Um, that's when I kind of changed. Uh, okay, I need to start making my ancestry tree my main tree. And I've slowly been improving it over and over, you know. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, a lot to catch up with. So, but in terms of like using roots magic or family tree maker, anything like that, I don't, I started out on family tree maker way back in the day, back in the nineties, when I first did my first genealogy ever, uh, my parents got me the family tree maker software. It might've been, I do, I think it was family tree maker to be completely honest. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, but I do remember that we also got the like CDs from ancestry where it'd be like, you know, the you know, CD for these records and the CD for those other records. And I'd find stuff on my family in the U S and then I'd hit brick walls and then I'd kind of get disinterested. But once I got on a genie in 2009, um, that was when I really like was, that was when I became obsessed with genealogy. And ever since then, it's always been online because my big thing is collaboration. And so, you know, doing your tree on your own family computer, I definitely understand that in the sense of like, controlling everything in a lot more than what you can get with like ancestry or my heritage um but yeah i don't know i just prefer it online uh let's see ah i've started doing a thing with custom tags where i'll put tags on each person what kind of source i have for them dna matches news articles census personally or family knowing etc that's actually a great system to use and that's something that i've used a lot and um, I actually got really used to using it when I was working on investigative genetic genealogy because, you know, I worked with a team of people. I had to, you know, work with multiple genealogists. I had to work with analysts, DNA analysts and, you know, law enforcement officers and other people who needed to understand the trees and things like that. And so, you know, especially when you're dealing with tons and tons of cases and tons and tons of names and all of that, it's very hard to keep everything straight sometimes, uh, you know, just like remembering. So, you know, trying to go into a case and remember, okay, what are the matches I need to look at? Well, it's a lot easier when you go in and you've marked each DNA match and you have it in there in your notes, how much they're matching and all of that. And so, uh, it became very useful in organization, but especially in that collaboration. So, um, you know, something I've considered talking about and possibly doing either a presentation about or maybe maybe a video or I don't know. I don't know if it'd do that well on YouTube, but something that basically talked about how to do genealogy in a collaborative setting, because a lot of people don't really understand the things that you can do to make collaboration that much easier. And I definitely learned a lot of tricks when I was working IgG because I did a lot of collab, a lot more collaboration really uh, in a tight knit basis than I had ever done before. Because, you know, most of the collaboration I do, it's, you know, very minimal of, you know, distant relatives or people that just seem to be interested in that and then working together on just that thing as opposed to working on a singular case with multitudes of people. Um, which is something that I think more genealogists should consider doing for families. And it's something that I've utilized now for my YouTuber family tree series. So like with Max Miller's family tree, if you remember, I had Michael Waz in the video talking about the, you know, building the tree and all this stuff. And, you know, to do that, I had him jump into the tree and actually, you know, he's been working on more than just that line. I mean, I've actually had genealogists, not just him, um, who have been working on that as well. So it's very, this kind of stuff is extremely useful um, for your organization, but also for possible collaboration. Um, and it just, it, it, especially just using the tags they already have there can make it really easy just to keep things straight for yourself. Because the more that you build, the more you get out there, the less you're going to remember 
of each individual branch. And basically every time you go back, it's like, you've got to go back through your notes to be, you know, you need to catch back up to be fully on deck with what you're, you know, dealing with. Um, so yeah, I like to add the sources and the photos. I'm afraid some records will vanish with the new data protection laws. Yeah. There's always that possibility. And I don't know if other people run into this. I know I was talking to a few genealogists who have this feeling all the time, but it's like, you'll find a record and you think you found it super easily. And so you're like, you don't, take note of it yet or like you just do something else and then something happens and you lose the page and you go back to try to find it and, all, and then all of a sudden it's like you just can't find what you've found before and so yeah it's definitely worth worthwhile doing a lot of that stuff um daniel what the hell you're like way earlier than normal absolutely i'm not that much earlier than normal i'm at a pretty usual time uh it's just that right now I'm assuming, I, I can't remember for sure, but Daniel, I think you're one of the ones who's in Europe. And if that is the case, the U.S. did the, uh, 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 what do you call it? Hour back thing, daylight savings time, but it hasn't happened in Europe yet, which I know happens at the end of March. And uh, I know this very well because all the people I work with throughout the world, the hour changed for us, but not for them. Um, so I'll actually be speaking to a group that's based out of London, uh, the Sephardic Genealogy Group, who you can go to Sephardic Genealogy on YouTube. They have their own webpage. You'll be able to watch me do a presentation this Sunday. But they had to actually make note of it for all their followers because they have a lot of people in the U.S. And so usually their talks are at 2 p.m. in the Eastern time, but it's going to be 3 p.m. Eastern time because that's this. That's going to be – it's only four hours ahead instead of five, the typical five hours ahead. Because usually 2 p.m. Eastern is going to be 7 p.m. In, in London. Oh, gosh. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Uh, weird. I've never, been, <clears throat> I've never been forced to have an assistant looking at microfilm. I also screenshot thousands of records using snipping tool when they want like $5 per copy. Oh, no. No, I'm not talking about an, I wasn't talking about an assistant for microfilm. I was talking about more of like, when you go to an archive, um, especially kind of more back in the day, basically like you needed someone who understood all of the collections that were available so that you like had someone to go to of like, okay, this is kind of what I'm looking for. This is what I know about the family. What can I look at? And then they kind of are like, oh, well, we have these record sets and, or these uh, so a lot of stuff that wouldn't even really be microfilm or microfiche, but the stuff that's like the records that they hold. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm talking about more. Like the card catalog ones was really where I was re referring that from. Uh, because like a lot of the places, like, you know, that's kind of the way it is, is they'll tell you, okay, well, these, or at least in my experience, it's like, okay, well, these are the collections that you want to look at. Here are the card catalogs and here are the numbers that correlate to which collections you want to look at. And then you open up the drawer and you go through the card catalog. And when you find the card with the name or whatever, however they have it indexed of what you're like, okay, this is what I want. Then you give it to them and then they go and they like get the box of whatever, if you can get that stuff. And then they, you know, you pull it out and you go through all this stuff. And like, that's kind of more of what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. But yeah, with the microfilm ones, those are easy because you just open up those big metal drawers and you just look for whatever you're looking for. You know, granted, it's kind of like a library where as long as they have it organized in a pretty good way, it's easy to find. But otherwise, yeah. Um, okay. Catching up. If Ancestry is your main tree, you do download copies of the sources that you find there. Yes. Yeah. So I have I have a like hard drive thing um, that I do. So like I'll I'll, I'll put those into my genie tree, <laughs> uh, but then I'll usually save a copy. So like I actually have like I have a hard drive that uh, one of my first hard drives is basically packed full of uh, records from the Bethlehem Cemetery in Oderkirk on to Amstel. Um, I use roots magic, but it's a bit of a pain to maintain multiple trees. I'd likely, I'd like to have ancestry as my main one, but a bit worried about not having full control over it. Well, ancestry, you have full control over it for the most part. I mean, the only control you don't have over it is 
if Ancestry decides to block your access for some reason, or they no longer become a company and stop hosting the stuff or, you know, but, um, you know, it, it, it's more of Genie and Family Search and WikiTree, the collaborative trees where others can, you know, where you don't really have full control over it. But when it comes to Ancestry, I mean, it really is full control for the most part. You know, it's just a matter of do you trust that Ancestry would do something that would, you know, they go in and edit your tree or something, which I don't think they would. But, I, you know, I don't know. Um, but I definitely understand why some people prefer using Roots Magic and stuff like that. And, um, yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, true. As long as GEDCOM files are downloadable or uploadable, both online and offline can be used. Um, Ancestry has more privacy than the others as anyone can add to the others whereas Ancestry you actually have to message the individual. My Heritage is the same. My Heritage, it's a private tree. Um, and then there's a lot of other sites that, where it's private trees. Um, like I think GenieNet is a private one. I don't think GenieNet's a collaborative tree but I could be wrong. I, that's one I've looked in, I've wanted to look into that I just haven't yet. Um, and then uh there's a few others that are just blanking in my mind. <laughs> so, all right. Do you, do you find 23andMe genetic trees helpful or unreliable? Uh, this is actually an interesting question because the 23andMe genetic tree is honestly one of the first advanced AI tools that I saw for DNA. Um, especially it's been the most advanced attempt in the sense of like actually trying to recreate a family tree. I honestly think that it, it, in the ones that I saw, there was some benefit to it because it was able to identify some things, but it wasn't really, I, I'd say it was maybe like 60 or 70% accurate from what I could tell. So like, you know, for the most part, it would read, like you would figure out maternal side and paternal side somewhat well uh, for the branches, but not always. And I would often find that it always had at least one branch on the maternal side or paternal side that really was part of the other side. Uh, but then again, I've also worked mostly with a lot of Jewish uh, profiles, but not all uh, on 23andMe. And so that could be part of it is the endogamy. Um, and I have found that in terms of like, it's kind of useful in a clustering sense. So if you look at the family tree and don't look at it and be like, okay, so those are my, you know, that's one side, that's the other side. And it definitely is like this. Think of it more as kind of a clustering of like, okay, these are probably related to me. And these ones may also be related to me through a similar line as those ones, but really they're kind of two separate clusters. So I need to just keep that in mind sort of thing. So uh, hopefully that kind of, hopefully that kind of makes sense. So, you know, not completely reliable that, you know, you can look at it and it's exactly perfect, but definitely I think it's a useful tool and it'd be interesting to see as things go along, how that improves. Um, but like, you know, for a lot of you asking, you know, what are the other DNA AI stuff? Well, side view on ancestry, the genetic communities and you know, all of the different things that they've been rolling out uh, that do the auto stuff. That's really just AI. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, family tree DNA is also private trees. But that one, I mean, I, you, you can build a family tree on family tree DNA. But that they it's not a good place to really build a tree for tree building purposes. Uh, it's really just really good to have a, a tree for genetic genealogy purposes, which, you know, it is definitely good to have a very update, up-to-date tree and a lot of information there. Um, but I find that it's usually best to just make it so that people can find your family tree elsewhere very easily. <laughs> That's better. Uh, hey, Irene, wonderful to have you representing North Carolina. NC represent. <laughs> uh, hi from France here. So, of course, I use Genie Night. You can put your trees on private there, but you can also keep them open for collaborative research. Okay, that must be why I was confused because I always thought there is the private option, but then it always seemed like there was like a there was a collaborative version because I'd see multiple managers on certain stuff. Or yeah, so 
Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Um, D Road, how do you feel about the Family Echo website as a low tech way to catalog family trees? Yeah, Family Echo is one that like I've used so little um, that you know I really can't speak on it. I mean, honestly, my use of it was you know over the years, every probably every couple of years, <laughs> kind of getting onto it. Um, like how how long has Family Echo been around? Because uh, I feel like. remember if it was if it's like newer older but i never really liked it because it felt just so old school kind of how they did it and i don't know I, I probably should look more into it and and mess around with it more uh than i have um but yeah no i honestly don't really have enough experience with it <laughs> Uh, but I guess, yeah, as a low tech way to catalog family trees, um, I mean, if that's kind of your preferred method. Uh, hi, Sandy from Wake County. <laughs> uh, Drea, 23Me's genetic tree thing helped me get a great lead on the bio family of a friend's adopted grandmother. Nice. Uh, Douglas Hoosman, no, don't have endogamy and still run into such issues on 23Me. That's that's kind of what I figured is the case. Uh, I found out that private notes I have on ancestry trees went public when I uploaded a GEDCOM files to my heritage. So I had to make the trees private at my heritage. Yeah, one of the difficulties with taking some of the more advanced uh, family tree sites and then downloading a GEDCOM and then uploading it elsewhere is that because each site is just slightly different in how they handle things, Sometimes GEDCOMs look really wonky when you upload it to a different database. And that was actually an issue I had when uh, a few years ago, I got a big family tree made of my dad's side because we had a, a family reunion at the building my great grandfather used to own as the Ross house, a, a restaurant in Philadelphia. And so I wanted to have a big family tree and the place that I went to, I can't remember what it was. I'd have to look back again. But I was really surprised that when I sent them everything, I was like, okay, well, you know, is there going to be a, you know, edit process where basically, you know, I just do kind of a once over and just, you know, make sure that everything looks right. And they basically said like, well, to do that, we charge you this, which was like, it was almost like twice the, the price. I forgot what it was, but it was absolutely ridiculous. Like, okay, may, that's just too much. Um, but it was like, you know, well, I, I'm just, I just want to make sure that it all comes out. You know, nothing comes out wonky because I was downloading it from genie.com, which has a lot of advanced options, especially at that time that you didn't find elsewhere. So it's like, you know, whatever program she, or that I, whatever program that company was using, to make the family tree for me, it was like, you know, how am I going to know if it comes out? And so when it, we got it, there were some issues that it was like, had I just been able to go through it or even just had, if they had been able to go through it and say, Hey, we noticed these, these things, how do you want us to handle it? So like there was ones where uh, the way that like, if we marked the profile as deceased, but there was no death date, it would just come out as zero, 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 zero. And then it was like printed like that. And then there were some where like, for some reason, the names came out wrong. Um, it was only a few that came out odd. And like the worst one was there was one where my second cousin's name was Isaac and they had it as Jacob. And it was like, what? <laughs> so that was really, really kind of frustrating. So that's something that, you know, I know from experience that when you're having a JEDCOM from one site to another, it's not always going to translate right. And so things like that, like, yeah, the, 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 you know, private notes and things like that, they may not be listed as private once you download the GEDCOM. So wherever you upload it, you kind of need to keep mind, keep, be mindful of that. Um, Dre, I used to use family echo to make family trees for characters. I was writing nowadays. I'm thinking of using it as an easier way to share relevant portions of my trees with relatives. Interesting. Um, Kosovo, my highest DNA match, 86.1 Centimorgan, 
knows that our great grandmothers were sisters. We'd be third cousins. But frustratingly, nobody from either side knows their parents. Brick wall from 1920/30s India. Interesting. Um, I actually just got contacted by a company from India. And like I was actually when I got the email, it was like the email. It was like it, it was like one of those emails where I was like, OK, this doesn't seem like a scam. But at the same time, it might be a really good, good scam. And so I kind of did a little bit of research first and it seemed to be OK from what I could find. And then I looked it basically it was this website. I'm me us. And it's based in india and it's about indian ancestry and so i'm probably gonna message him back and see you know what are they thinking about but um i don't know you just mentioning that just i thought that was interesting so if anyone has experience with this uh website i'd love to learn a bit more about them because uh at least somebody from the the company or somebody pretending to be from the company contacted me about uh working with me so um yeah, I guess we'll we'll have to see, but yeah, maybe maybe that'll be helpful for you. You can tell us about it. Um, yeah, I'm always scared of companies from India when they contact. Yeah, but then at the same time, it's like you know, where are the Indian based genealogy companies probably going to be based in India? So you know, when I got the email, I went to Google and like I googled the company website with the you know word review and other stuff and. You know, everything I saw seemed hunky dory and their social media profiles. I saw multiple genealogists that I was, you know, very high end genealogists who were, you know, are as well known or possibly even more well known than I am in the genealogy community and probably more well respected. Although I guess maybe it's just because they're very well respected, in my opinion. I, I respect them a lot. Uh, so I saw a lot of them following this company's social media stuff. So it made me a little bit more comfortable. Although I did look at their YouTube channel and their YouTube channel, little rough, <laughs> little rough, but you know, I guess you can't always have everything you're working on be, you know, that amazing. Um, let's see. Arcadians and Dogamus. Why do they marry their own family? No offense. Uh, I mean, I don't remember the exact, I don't know the exact, exact history with the Acadians specifically. Um, you know, I have a good general idea of the history, but not enough to, I guess, give you like the specific reasoning of them marrying their own family other than, you know, probably a cultural, uh, religious sort of thing, I guess. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, Acadians were, you know, they were kicked out of, uh, of Nova Scotia. A lot of them were, and, you know, they weren't exactly treated super well. So that was probably a big part of it. Um, but yeah, so, okay, here we go. Brian Nash, how we got here. Genealogy. I can help with Acadian questions. Yeah. He, so Brian is a Canadian genealogist and he specializes in Canadian ancestry. So he could definitely probably answer that a, a bit better than I could. But, um, you know, as far as I know, it, you know, the basic answer for, for why Canadians were endogamous was cultural uh, ties. Um, so yeah, Kosovo. Looking at it, seems to be like collateral trees, but no actual records. Interesting. Their site did say that they had a lot of records and that they were digitizing more. So um, I wonder if it's a site that you know, hope maybe will improve to be kind of like an ancestry of India or something. But I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Um, my dad has realized that the Indians, his company outsourced, are the best employees. The scam call centers drag down a lot of good employees. Yeah, and I watch a, I watch a good bit of that scam call center takedown videos. And like, actually, funny enough, Pleasant Green, uh, for those who are familiar with his channel, he's kind of part of that world. He was actually at Roots Tech one year working uh, for that uh, or working with uh, Roots Tech uh, because I believe he's with the LDS Church actually. Because um, I remember I was like, he was he he was the person at the media center letting people in and out. And I remember being like, he looks so familiar. And I'm trying to think of like, you know, he's got to be a genealogy guy. And I'm like, you know, you look familiar. And he said, you know, Pleasant Green. It's like, oh yeah, and the grace of God. And <laughs> yeah, or by the grace of God. Yeah. 
uh, that was how I was able to break down my great great grandfather George's brick wall. I sent his tree from someone on Genie Net. Oh, I was sent. Yeah, nice. Um, Gazillion PT rural communities are quite endogamous wherever they were and however the religion. Yeah, but I guess with with endogamy affecting DNA, it really has to be hundred not hundreds of generations, but hundreds of years of generations over generations with very little, very little uh in and out like i know like a lot of people will talk about american colonial endogamy and there's a big argument amongst gen genetic genealogists of is it actually like a light version of endogamy or is it really just very recent pedigree collapse that kind of has a similar effect of endogamy but you know it's really not like you know it wasn't like you know for hundreds of years, you know, is more of like, you know, maybe a hundred years or 150 years, but there was always people coming into the communities, people leaving the communities. And so it really wasn't quite as, yeah. So, I mean, it is a big question uh, in terms of Brian. Yes. Re Acadian, same as most endogamous communities was cultural. Also with the deportation, some of the communities were isolated for a time and therefore could seem more that way. Yeah. So, well, when it comes to the talk of Acadians, they're an endogamous population, but then there's a founding population out of that Acadian group, which became the Creole and Cajun population groups. And those were much more isolated and had a much stronger endogamy uh, effect on their DNA. So like if you do, if you're, if you're coming from a family that has Cajun or Creole ancestry, all of your ancestors from, or not all your ancestors, all of your genetic matches from that Cajun Creole side you're going to be sharing lots of DNA with them more than you would with your other matches. Um, so all my known ancestors come from within a 40 kilometer radius of my parents' village. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's get into the, we're, we're chatting a lot. Let's do some uh, genealogy. So we were looking at Samuel. Now let's, uh, I guess let's look at uh somewhere else so actually you know what let's look at the bars side uh so this is when i talk about my uh sephardic ancestry i will often it's like i have to figure out how much i am because um where am i gonna choose it uh where there we go oh wait i can go here morris so I go based off of my, my great grandfather, Morris. So Morris was, uh, um, his parents, Abraham and Jane, Abraham was fully Sephardic is like all of his ancestry up to like his second or third great grandparents were Sephardic. And then his most recent non Sephardic ancestry is actually his, um, Royal ancestry through the Enriquez Pimentel line which I think I discussed in the last one. Yeah, it goes up to David. We'll just go and add that because I know that. <clears throat> and then David, it says Enrique, <clears throat> but that's not. Oh, by the way, something I don't know if a lot of people do. If you have an unknown name, whether it's the first name or the last name or the middle name, do five underscores because if you don't like here, I'm just going to leave it blank. Now Pimento, when you look at it, it just says Pimento. So you don't know, is it the first name? Is it the last name? What is it? So a good technique, do five of those and boom. Now, you know, okay, it's the last name. So, but then from there, his father is Juan Alonso Pimento the first Duke of Benevente. So Juan Alonso Pimentel. And so we have like, there's a whole thing with a uh, cartel. Let's see if we can actually find someone linking one here. Um, okay. Let's see if we can actually. Um, let's 
So, well, what better thing to use than what we were just talking about, GenieNet? And so down here, so these images are from the arms letter. And basically what this letter says is this letter is saying that David Enriquez Pimentel, this David Enriquez Pimentel, born 1631, dies 1696, that he is a grandson of Juan Alonso Pimentel. We do not know. Nobody has been able to prove with a confidence of a genetic genealogical proof standard that David's father, uh, who David's father is. So even here you can see ex Pimentel, but that this unknown is the son of Juan Alonso or yeah. So it's, it's not quite certain who I've been trying to get Y DNA testing done for this line. Um, but the main point here being uh, going back here is that for my great grandfather's father, that's our most recent non Sephardic ancestry. Everything else, as far as we know, is Sephardic. Um, but then for his mother's side, she is one eighth Sephardic, which we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, So going back, there we go. So one A Sephardic with Rachel Barzilai being her most recent Sephardic ancestor. So when I figure out how much I am of Sephardic, well, I have to consider first, okay, well, my great grandfather, he was half fully Sephardic and one half one eighth Sephardic. So if I basically look at that of, um, so we have one eighth and eight out of eight, then we have nine 16th, which then means that half of nine sixteenths, or so my great grandfather Morris was nine sixteenths Sephardic, and then his son, my grandfather, was nine thirty seconds uh, uh, Sephardic. Let's see, <laughs> bust out the calculator on this one. So nine out of thirty two, so that's 0.28 percent, so just a little over a quarter. And then my mom is half of that, so about 14%. And then I'm half of that, which is about 7%, which I think I did that same math if you watch the video of me going through my DNA results. Um, so that's why I always go through that stuff. But I'm thinking, with all of that fun stuff said, we'll uh, research the Barzillai line. Um, now, interestingly enough... I am not a big fan of it spelled this way. Some of the family members did spell it that way, but this is actually a Dutch style of spelling. And the way that the family historically spelled the name was this way, Barzillay. Um, so honestly, let's see what comes up this way. So Rachel born 1802. Nothing there. We'll go to the Amsterdam archives because we're going to have more there anyway. Now, one of the nice things about the Dutch or uh, Amsterdam is they give you this beautiful little guide. Is it showing up? There we go. Okay. So they give you this guide of how the, how you can manipulate stuff so that it's uh it works better so let's make this english so it makes more sense so you can do search for people with name part that sounds like search for meyer and all variants that differ by one letter or by two letters or you can do this where search for people with the names of all sorts of whatever so we're going to do the asterisk which is pretty common on these so we'll do that and we're going to change. So we have 1806. Father Moses. See, why is it coming in like that? All right. You know what we're going to do? Okay. 
Okay. Moses. What is the date they give? February 26th. Here we go, Rachel Van Moses. Okay. And then Abigail De Jacob De Panetto. Yes, Abigail De Panetto. <clears throat> so 1802. Oh, where to go? Where to go? There we go. Yeah, 1802, February 26th. So we're good with that. All right. We'll just add this one then. Oh, it's De Abraham. Oh, look at, see, it looks so weird. See how it looks like it's D E E. They didn't, they didn't stop going from the De Abram. And that looks like an F. Look at, like, look at the comparison from this De Abraham to this one. And you can see why I was like, wait, what? Huh? Who? Uh, yeah, so, okay. So, Get that added in. Do not like the way that looks. I always take out the patronymics. And then looking at it, this is the community birth. And it's spelled Bars Ila, I L A Y. Now we're going to find her marriage. Um, Okay, I was going to say, it seems like it's glitching out. 1821. Oh, that's right. 1821. We're going to have to do civil register. After 1811 is when everything goes civil register. Which is probably why hers is bars a lie, because this is how the Dutch spelled bars a lie. And there we go. And there we go. Go to open arch. Now, some fun stuff with open arch. Weather. <laughs> what was the day like when they got married? 11 degrees Celsius, cold. Wind direction, northwest. So and then here, now this is, these are the records from Nord Holland, Nord Holland Archief. And this is the Hulichen registers. And so it's like, basically when they got married, they had to submit a whole bunch. Oh yeah. So here we have all of the pages. See that? I thought it was going to take us directly to it. Okay, let's. How do they have it? 1821. Okay, they have it by date. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so that's January. So we're looking for when was the marriage? February. Oh, it was May 30th, 1821. So we gotta go far with it. <clears throat> yeah, so they have to have all sorts of records when you get married, listing where you're born, bride, the the groom's name, the bride's name. So, oh wait, this is June. Let's see. Hmm. That's all they have. What are they going to... I don't know. Because this is just one record of the whole set. Let's see if this one's any easier <laughs> to figure out. 1821. Just trying to get a what I'm doing here is I'm just going through the records trying to get a feel for what date, you know, what order do they have these in? Is it by date? Is it by name? But kind of hard. Five September. October. Glitching out hard. All right, let's see. Okay, so this is February. Let's see if we can find May. Twenty third of March. Oh, I mean these ones. Twenty ninth of March. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so it's still 29th of March. Now let's try, let's try 500. 
April. April. Okay, July. Oh, wait, no, that was their birth. That was their birth. April. I just want to find me. It's a lot of April weddings, huh? Okay, May 23rd, and we want May 30th. Cornelia de Groot. That's May 10th. Well, we don't like to see it go back in time. That's not good. Seventh. <laughs> okay. April, May. Maybe I just need to get a little bit further. Wait. <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll find it. Maybe we'll find it. Wait, no, not my one. No, we were January 4th. Okay. I guess this is going to be one of these sets where I got to learn a bit more about it. I am so lost. All right. Let's see. Two. Well, that's where this record is. So what was I looking in? Oh, wait, that's right, let's see. Okay. 
one thing I wish is they had an easier way to scroll through a lot of these. So that's One seventy seven B. <laughs> oh, that's the case. This uh, 77, yeah. All right, let's start at the beginning. Okay. No, this is register three. Why are they calling it register three? Okay. It registered to. Oh, ho, ho. All right. Okay. This does not look right. <laughs> this does not look right. Um, am I in the wrong year or something, aren't I? All right, <laughs> way off, way off. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna have to try to do this one on my own. Okay, well, you can't win them all, people. You can't win them all. <laughs> so, um, Uh, you've got to look at the optim optimumer number. <laughs> yeah, register to Folio 177V. So I don't know. I don't know. Off somehow. Off somehow. I almost found it.
Unless is it? Wait, is this it? Wait. Because all of a sudden, now the names are actually. I mean, this is, yeah, this is what we're looking for. So wait, why is it? Okay, then what are the first few documents then? This is part of why I need to learn my uh, Dutch a lot better. Oh, V means verso, so the other side. Okay, yeah, this is 177, and we want 177V. Uh, aha. Okay. <laughs> I was about to say, I was like, I can't believe. Oh, wow. Glad that I kept clicking through then, because it's like that image where they're like, the guy's like digging through. And he stops and he's walking away, but he's like got only that much left. How funny. So, okay, yeah, this is what I know. So with the registers, yeah, it gives you these were all submitted with the marriage. So nice. Okay, so we're going to find the first V. Nah, it's not quite how I want to do it. I don't think that gives me the thinking I need. That take me to where I need? Oh, it does. Okay, cool. Now, nah, I'll just add it the other way. We'll add it the way I did it before. And web link, web address, link name, Google link, register, or no, Google link, sorry. No, it is the register. Who leaks by Lachen? Who leaks by Lachen? What was that? What was that? Had that too. Wait, did I close the wrong? Ah, whatever. I think I put the right thing in. Who leaks up the on open arch? Well, we don't have a in Amsterdam. Cool. Joy Kendrick, I just found out my dad is not my dad. Well, I, I guess that means you just took a DNA test. And um, yeah, I mean, that's it's definitely one of those things that's uh, rough to do. But if you want to find your biological family, um, your biological father, uh, you do have options, especially since I'm assuming you've already DNA tested. So uh, definitely look into search angels if you uh, haven't yet. But, 
but also consider possibly hiring a genealogist or if you're on this stream, I'm guessing you're learning genealogy yourself. So you may be able to do it yourself as well. Uh, coffee and tea looks like I missed the live. No, you're here. You made it in time. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be, you know, going a little bit longer, not too much. Well, actually, yeah, I'm probably going to end in the next five, 10 minutes, honestly, but yeah, no, it's still, I'm still going. Uh, a Frisian saved the day. <laughs> um, better than finding out he's your mom, I guess. Uh, have you checked out the new labs feature for family search yet? Just saw a video about it earlier. No, I haven't yet. I haven't, but I need to. Um, I think Rachel was born January 26th. Uh, well, no, we had the, uh, uh, whatchamacallit pulled up. Um, yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> we'll do it that way. <laughs> that works too. That works too. Um, yeah, no, here's the, here's the birth record. So Rachel Van Moses to Abraham Barsley and then Abigail de Jacob de Pinedo, 26th of February. Also the 29th of Adar or 24th of Adar. I can't tell if that's a nine or a four. Could go either way. Uh, yeah, let's see. We'll do a heap cal. Heap cal conversion. Uh, let's see. We'll just do... 26th of February, 1802. So, yeah, 24th of Adar. There we go. So, we got 26th, 24th of Adar. And then that's matching up here with the community birth record. So, the way the birth records work here females on the right, Macius. Youngins on the left, boys. Youngins and Mesha. Ich bin hang youngin. Ich bin hang Mesha. Ich bin ein Mann. <laughs> okay, in the Hulik's Bailachen, it states January, but must be wrong. Yeah. I mean, it makes it definitely makes sense though, too, because with the marriage, you're at the time of the marriage versus the time of the birth where this is this is done. Um, so, but yeah, definitely, definitely not not to you know not uncommon to have uh, stuff and things. So very important. Lekka belong tag. Um, all right. Yeah, I think, I think I'm going to probably kind of end it around here now. It's been a pretty fun stream. I know I, I had really little planned. Um, I do want to get a lot of ideas from you all. Uh, if anyone has any ideas of things you'd like me to do other than just family tree building and answering questions. Um, cause I know like doing the tier ranking stuff and the geography quizzes and stuff, is a lot of fun to do, but at the same time, um, you know, once you do it once, it's like, well, I don't want to do it over and over. You know, I don't want to do a bunch of geography streams and you can only really tier rank stuff once. Uh, there's not many tier rank stuff for genealogy, but yeah, I just kind of love to hear uh, some ideas. So might try doing live streaming at places. Uh, give uh, give my DJ pocket another chance, uh, you know, without a massive setting like Rootstech being involved. But um, yeah, so uh, other than that, Really appreciate everyone being on the stream today. Uh, I know it's kind of weird timing with the daylight saving time and all that, but um, definitely, uh, definitely uh, like and all of that fun stuff. And yeah, I'm just, 
<laughs> I think it's just been a long week for me. So, um, yeah, show how to use Watto with 23andMe. Well, I mean, Watto kind of works no matter what, but with uh, any of them, it doesn't really change it up that much. Uh, but yeah, maybe I'll do something where I'm doing Watto live or something. Uh, reactionary to certain new features in some of the big sites. Yeah. The hardest thing with doing live genealogy stuff is I have to make sure beforehand that I don't do anything where I accidentally dox myself or dox other people. Uh, because with some of these sites, they have you enter in private information that like, like on genie.com, I, I can't go to my public profile while I'm logged in because with genie, it just has it kind of certain stuff there that like, I do not want on there. Um, and then other, some of the other sites have stuff like that too. So I'll, I just have to double check like with DNA painter, I have to be really careful because um, you know, all the Watto trees and DNA painting things and all the stuff I've done for private clients and uh, for my own family stuff. And then also for upcoming YouTuber family trees and things. And like, it's like, I, I don't want to give too much away. So like, yeah, but definitely something to, to look into. Um, Duck and Dutch records are so inspirational. Yeah, they truly are. Truly are. Um, thanks. It's great to watch an expert. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, buy all like the stream if you've not already. Yes, please like the stream. Um, yep, that's true. Uh, before this ends, everybody could click the like button. Thank you. Yes, great. <laughs> it would be great to get lots of likes uh, and shares and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I think I think with that, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday, or if it's already Saturday where you're at, have a wonderful weekend. But thank you all for being here.